Welcome everybody to the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness um, series of by name list and coordinate access webinars and community practice calls. As I said earlier, today is a webinar and the topic of discussion is on creating buy-in buy for coordinate access and by name list efforts. Um, it is March 9th, 2021. Can you believe it? It is actually almost summer. It has been basically a year. Um, that we have been dealing with COVID-19 and all of its ramifications. Hopefully people are starting to see maybe some positive adjustments in that realm. Um, we're hoping that you've been able to uh, navigate that storm as well as possible and that you are still able to move forward with your efforts in coordinated access. And, uh, and we are hoping that today we can provide you with a little bit of additional information and insight that might help you. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, to start with, um, something that we're trying to do on a regular basis is um, continue to create awareness and understanding around reconciliation and around the importance of where it is that we are doing the work that we are doing, where it is that we are living where it is that we are recreating and um, and whose land it, it really is and that we are enjoying the privilege of accessing and utilizing those spaces. So we have provided a um, sort of a pan-Canadian version of a land acknowledgement that I would like to um, just share and read out to people today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all of the lands that we're, we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. So again, we are grateful for um, the ability and the opportunity to acknowledge that, to, to recognize those factors. So uh, please, I hope that you take that time as well to give that some consideration and some thoughts. Um, the Canadian Alliance mission is to lead a national movement of individuals, organizations, and communities working together to end homelessness. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but uh, we believe pretty important and we hope that, that you believe that is the same. And we're assuming that you do, otherwise you wouldn't be on this webinar today. So a little bit about Canadian Alliance, just to remind most of you, most of you have seen this slide and have been to our, our, our main website, these are the things that you'll find there. These are the various components or, or um, sectors of our organization. We have the conference um, that we have had on a yearly basis, although COVID-19 has created a disturbance in that trend and process this last year. And, uh, and it's actually caused some more adjustments as um, we'll be, you'll be getting further announcements about the format and platform for um, the next conference coming up um, in uh, 2021. So uh, pay attention to that. Continue to go to our website and click on that link and you'll get more information there. We have Built for Zero Canada. Many of you who are on the call today have been participating in uh, Built for Zero's model for affecting change in co with coordinated access. And the... Um, intense efforts on, on including data and, and, and allowing data to help you make those changes and build your coordinate access system. Then there is us. Jessica and Lisa on the call with us today. We do, oh, great, yeah, thanks Jody. We have Jessica um, and Lisa who are improvement advisors for the Built for Zero program. They have joined us. We love them. We're always happy to have them um, included in what we do and we welcome them to share any of their insights today because we are certainly not the experts. We are just the people with, as the Canadian Alliance says, 
holding the big red ball for this presentation today. Um, then there's, of course, Jody and myself, and then Quinn, Quinn Morky, who is also my other trainer, who is the Training and Technical Assistance Program. And we are all things Training and Technical Assistance. Imagine that. And then there is the Allied Networks, which, as you see here, uh, it is several networks and uh, separate groups that we have some really in-depth and, and intimate partnerships with around uh, various aspects and components of ending homelessness, such as um, our uh, Right to Housing Network and the Rural and Remote um, Network or the, the National Alliance to End Rural and Remote Homelessness. We have the Lived Experience Network and uh, multiple others. So feel free again to click on that link and learn more about that. And then of course we have our advocacy component, which houses our Recovery for All campaign, as well as other efforts that, that the Canadian Alliance is engaged in to create and, uh, and enhance the advocacy work around any homelessness. So feel free, cah.ca, go in there, check it all out. Links to all of those other sites are there. So to talk about the topic at hand today, I wanted to share a quote with you from, or not a quote, but um, some ideas from Isaac Newton. And this is his definition of inertia. Um, the vis in sita, or innate force of matter, is a power of resisting by which every body, as much as in it lies, endeavors to preserve its present state, whether it be of rest or moving uniformly forward in a straight line. So essentially what Isaac Newton is telling us here is that if things are at a steady pace, then there is a tendency for them to remain at that steady pace. And there is a tendency for them to not move out of that steady pace or of that particular um, line of movement unless a powerful enough force causes it to move. Hence, the further part of his uh, hypothesis around for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. But the key I want to hone in on here is that this is also connected to what others have said is potentially a cause of the problem of resistance to change in even a social capacity. So uh, another psychologist by the name of Ralph Ryback said that inertia or a tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged is at the headwinds of any change that we make in our lives. So we also, from a social perspective, have a tendency to want to do nothing or to remain unchanged. And that's a big factor when it comes to creating buy-in, because what are we trying to create buy-in for? Any buy-in we want is really about creating change. And change is difficult. Change is a hard thing for people to um, enact in their lives, in their personal lives. And if it's hard to enact in your own personal life, how much more difficult might it be to create in a larger systemic capacity? So as um, is initially what this means then is that um, change means something different. And to us, different often means something bad or something uncomfortable. And, and so therefore, it's really important that we figure out how to help and support people through that change process or through that buy-in process of something that is different than what is the norm. Mark Twain said, I'm in favor of progress, but it's change that I don't like. So therefore, um, he also, uh, I guess, reiterates the factor that, it's, that, that change is not an easy thing. We all would like things to be different, but we really don't want to change what we're doing personally. I also want to share with you a story about gloves. There was um, a mid-level 
business executive who was trying to get upper management to understand that there was some challenges in their expenditures within their organization. And uh, the organization was not seeing it. They were just saying, well, you know what? Things look fine to us. Um, we don't see any big problem. And, uh, and so we don't see any reason to make any change. And he was really frustrated by this because he could see what was happening. And so that was kind of the key is how do I make them see what is happening? So what he did is he brought in the hundreds and hundreds of different types of gloves that were being ordered by all of the departments in this corporation in their efforts to do their work. And he dumped them all on the table and showed them that this is what's happening, that we have every imaginable different kind of glove being ordered by all of these different people. And therefore it's creating a huge discrepancy in expenditures and we're not being efficient with those dollars. And seeing this pile of gloves was enough to awaken these executives and change was created after that. What didn't, what they didn't take seriously before, the imagery and the actual evidence in front of them is what made the difference. So even when change is obviously necessary, you might not be able to get people to care enough to support it. And sometimes they're happy with what they have and the way it is, or what may not have happened is we haven't addressed the question about what's in it for me. What makes the difference for me? And so we have to ask then, how can we use that concept to elicit support for your idea or to, to enlist buy-in about your idea or about the change that you want to make? And in this case, the buy-in is around coordinated access and by name lists. So what is in it for me is kind of the big question. To further highlight that, I want to share with you a bit of a pattern and, and a bit of a formula that I think makes sense to consider as we work towards creating this buy-in. Initially, we have to introduce what it is we're talking about. And as we introduce it, we have to listen for buy-in. I'm gonna highlight this again a little bit later, um, but I would suggest that this is very similar actually in what we use in the, the, the skills of motivational interviewing for helping to create change is we are listening for change talk. I would suggest here we have to listen for buy-in talk. Secondly, we have to be able to express our vision in a, as a positive future. What is going to make this change? What is going to make coordinated access and by name lists a positive change for the future? Why is it going to be better down the road if we do this? And then the third thing is we have to be able to craft our buy-in story that we're going to share with people. And I know that there are, are some things being posted in the chat. I'm not sure what they are yet, but Jody, if there's anything that you believe is important that we interrupt and talk about, then feel free to let me know. No, I just, I, Leslie has sent in a quote that says, not everything that is faith, faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Mm. It's Baldwin. So it really uh -huh. fits what you're talking about. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. So I mentioned a formula. So I'm going to share this formula with you. Essentially what it says is that dissatisfaction, which what that really means is making sure that people understand or are clear about the fact that they're not okay with the status quo. There's something about the status, status quo that we're dissatisfied with. So dissatisfaction plus a good healthy vision plus defined first steps have to be greater than the resistance to change. So let's talk about those. Let's talk about what that means. And to begin with, I want to just to mention a couple of initial thoughts that we have to consider very in-depthly who is our audience and maybe even the question of 
is there a limit to our audience? I think too often we limit the people that we think we have to deliver this message to and that we have to create buy-in with. I think we think or we believe that there are a core set of stakeholders and those are the key people. And I believe by doing that, we often negate some very powerful and important influences within our community that we haven't necessarily considered. And we'll maybe be able to draw those out a little further as we go. I think it's important to solicit and draw from examples of others who have engaged in a similar process. People who are early adopters, people who um, have had the experience, people who have gone through the ups and downs and faced many of the challenges that we probably will face. And, and to draw those in and to beg, borrow, and steal from what they have learned. And my experience is, is that most communities who are developing coordinate access and the by name list process are very open and happy to share their learnings. So don't be afraid to do that. And don't feel like you have to recreate the wheel. That being said, it is important to take the learnings you get from other people and put them up or overlay them against your own community's context and demographics and um, dynamics that you're facing. Make sure they fit. Yeah, exactly. And then lastly, before I get further into these other things, consider the multiple methods of engagement that you have available to you. Don't limit yourself and don't assume that it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a one-shot deal. Consider that there are multiple ways to engage and, and share this information and work to create your buy-in. And um, what I will you do is take this opportunity to put a plug in for something that we uh, at, the, at the Training and Technical Assistance Program are working on and that we will be excited to be able to share with people broadly um, once we sort of fine tune it. But we are, we are working on a, a model of engagement, uh, a model that will allow um, us to improve and increase our, our level of engagement with the communities across the country that we work with, but would also in turn allow you as a community to improve and increase your levels of engagement with the people that are part of your system and so on and so forth. So uh, be looking forward to that, more to come. We're pretty excited about it. So first of all, around introduction and listening for buy-in. It's really important to take stock in our situation. Is change really necessary? How, what information do we need to gather and put together that identifies the importance of change? Just like with the story of the gloves, the, the change wasn't taken seriously until enough evidence and information around the current situation was provided and it became very clear. Again, I wanna draw some attention back to the idea of motivational interviewing, where we draw attention to ambivalence. That ambivalence is essentially the discrepancy between the status quo and the dissatisfaction that we talked about. If we are dissatisfied with the status quo, are our behaviors, are our efforts, is what our community doing in line with changing that dissatisfaction? Or is it in opposition to it? If it is, then we have ambivalence. We have a situation where people are, are not making one decision or the other. We're saying, I'm not happy with the current status, but what we're doing isn't addressing the current status and I've been okay with just inertia. So it's really important that we, that we consider that. Is our, are our efforts now in line with the idea that we want change in the status quo? We have to know the resistance. So I know that, that I'm, a, I'm a basketball coach, I've been a baseball coach, I've done a lot of things like that in sports. 
And I know the value of reviewing game tape, of looking at your opponent and understanding what their strengths are, understanding where they excel, understanding how they could potentially exploit my team's weaknesses and so forth. So I think the same principle can apply when we are looking to create buy-in as I think it's really important to be very clear about what is the resistance? What does that look like? What, what value is there? What are, the, uh, what are the concepts or what are the thoughts or what are the ideas that the resistance has that actually make sense? And do they have good points? And how do we build those in to creating buy-in in our current situation? And I'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. The next thing is important to engage the emotions around the particular topic. So when it comes to coordinate access and binding lists, how do we hone in on the pressure points? How do we identify where the pain is in our system? And what is the pain look like? What are the emotions related to that? Who are having the emotions related to that? And how do we identify and shine a light on that? How do we highlight the personal face and specific benefits affecting those you are speaking to? So we have to make it personal. We have to be able to create a, a story where all of the people you're talking to see their part in that story, where they see the character that they play, where they see how it's impacting them and where they see a role that they could potentially play, or at the very least, they see whether they want to play a role in that or not. And then it's important to include the voice of those most impacted. Yeah. So it, it, really what I'm talking about here is those with lived or living experience and making sure that they are able to tell their story, making sure that they are able to share how it has impacted them uh, how the status quo has impacted them and what change has been beneficial for them up until now, what change they would like to see and why. But we have to bring the true emotion. It can't be something contrived. It can't be something um, unauthentic. But true emotion is valuable, not because it's manipulating people, but because it's real. And that real emotion and that real story and situation is necessary to be able to help people see the clear picture. And then lastly here, I would say that, that it's really important to be able to identify and include in your story, in the picture, um, champions, key champions from your community that, that can tell the story, that have influence, that people will listen to, and that there is good reason for people to listen to them. And, and again, it's not about trying to manipulate people because, oh, we have, we have, you know, so-and-so on our committee, but it's because so-and-so will get people to actually pay attention to what the truth of the matter is, to what the real picture looks like. So those are important things there. Next, when we talk about expressing our vision as a positive future really important that we have to be inclusive. Do we have a broad spectrum of personalities and backgrounds included in the people that are at the table, the people that we're speaking to? Just like I was mentioning early on, are we actually including enough people? And I would say it's better to err on the side of too many than to run the risk of leaving important potential uh, really effective champions out by not including a broad enough spectrum. Sure. Do you have people with different spheres of influence engaged in, in, in what you're doing? Do you have them participating? Do you have them invited? You have to, again, it's part of being inclusive, but, but do we have enough variety of people that might be considered stakeholders, or maybe we're not sure if they're stakeholders. 
but who knows what we might bring to the table in terms of value added. Um, and are all of the people who will potentially be impacted represented? Are they all there? And that's how we create a positive future is by ensuring and letting everybody present know that this is inclusive of everyone. This is, and, and so then people see that and they say, you know what, there is, there is so many different varieties of people and stakeholders here. I can't see how this can't be a positive thing, at least to explore. There's a momentum there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the next point is solicit ideas from those stakeholders. Oftentimes we see that we create a core group that's going to sort of lead this process. But then there's a sense that the leadership of the process has to shoulder all of that responsibility and has to come up with those ideas or sometimes wants to be the ones that come up with all of those ideas. So we have to be willing to relinquish as a leader control over how the process plays out and be willing to grab ideas from everyone. And as you see the little quote that showed up below, if you want people to buy into your vision, ask for their help in crafting it. That's so huge. This also goes back to a quote I've often used when I talk about lived experience, where it says that if we want to have less meetings in our lives and we want the meetings that we do have to take less time, we need to include the people we're talking about in those meetings. So allow that voice to be heard and don't become prideful in your efforts in thinking that the work that we do has to be directed from me because I've been given responsibility for this. I've always believed that a good leader is a great follower and knows when to follow. So I think it's really important that we make sure that we are grabbing that information from everybody and being open to all of the ideas that people have to share, even if you know that they are in direct opposition to your own. And you have to be willing to look at those ideas objectively. Because amazingly enough, you might find out that somebody else knew something more than you. And that's always a fun experience. <laughs> Concrete details, okay? You have to have details that are, that are also, and I'll, I'll add to this, that are digestible and concrete. So what that really means is, is that we don't want to lay out a lengthy set of plans and ideas that are going to be overwhelming to people and often create information paralysis. People get overwhelmed by something that seems very large and, and then therefore undoable. And so keeping things concrete and succinct in our plans and in our vision are going to be important for people to be able to swallow what you're talking about. And if they can digest it, then they can get behind it. If they can make sense of it, they can get behind it. So create your vision by using bite-sized, um, tangible, digestible chunks. What's going to happen first? What's going to happen next? And what are the details of how that's going to play out, or at least the suggestions. But again, at the same time, you're also opening the door for people to express some questions, to express some challenges, and be open to um, revamping, be open to adjusting. So the next, when we're looking at, at crafting your buy-in story, some of the things we talked about are part of that as well. But I wanted to go back to this idea of it's important to use visuals and remind you of the glove story. It wasn't until the literal picture, the literal problem was dumped on the table in front of these executives that they understood. 
So be as visual as possible, be as concise as possible. And you have to use information that's real. It, it can't be, and, and, and I would suggest information that's real based on your community. You can use examples from other communities, but if you don't include examples from your own community as well, it will not create momentum because people won't see it as how it applies to them. And then people will have a tendency to revert back to inertia. If I can't see how it applies to me, what's the need for making a change now? Because I'm comfortable with the way it is now. Again, bite-sized chunks in your story. When you're presenting this story, keep it short, keep it brief, and it doesn't have to be all shared at once. You can, you can do this over multiple um, sessions, over multiple presentations, give people the opportunity to hear bits and pieces, listen for buy-in, listen for feedback, make adjustments, and come back in with the next section. But trying to produce or, or, or produce that buy-in by giving a sort of a one-shot deal in terms of the information you're sharing is going to create that, again, information paralysis. It's going to create that overload, and it's going to be difficult for them to comprehend it and make sense out of it. And so, therefore, you know, they may nod their heads and they may walk away saying, oh, that sounds kind of cool, but it's not going to sink in and it's not going to grab hold. And I've mentioned this a few times about the importance of asking for and being open to feedback. Um, I think we have a, a tendency sometimes to get married to our ideas. And, you know, I know that I have felt myself as I'm sharing or presenting different ideas. And, and sometimes I hear feedback that sounds very different than my initial thoughts. Sometimes I, I get this sort of little bit of a slug in the stomach and it takes the breath out of me and it's like I'm not sure if I can breathe or speak because it's like wait a minute I'm not sure I'm ready to relinquish that idea and and so therefore I think it's really important to evaluate and maybe even go back to a, a Stephen Covey principle of seek to understand then to be understood so when you get that feedback, make sure you're clear about it. Make sure you're clear about how it lines up with what you're saying. Make sure you understand what they're saying. Make sure you understand the intent and sort through it before you let it take the wind out of your sails. But you have to be open to that feedback. And I think this also is suggesting the value of slowing down in order to speed up. But we get in a hurry and think that we have to put all the pieces of coordinated access in place so fast that we sometimes don't allow ourselves to take the time necessary to really sort through these pieces of this process. We don't take the time to evaluate the feedback. We don't take the time to break things down into small pieces. And I, do, I, I get that there are challenges with you know, uh, funding agreements that might have deadlines and timelines associated with them. So therefore, by saying slow down to speed up doesn't mean delay your efforts. It's important to get started. But as you work through it, don't be in such a rush that you pass over really important pieces. There's a difference between slowing down and procrastinating. Last thing I'd like to share here, or sorry, not the last thing, but the, the second to last thing is really identify very clearly with the people that you're talking to what you're asking them for. Make sure that they know what they're getting into if they raise their hand to say, I'm in. Because we've often seen processes like this fall apart because what people thought they were getting into ended up being different in the end. And, and so it put them off, it frustrated them, and, 
and again, it, it created, I think, a, a bit of a sense of, uh, or a lack of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a lack of belief in what you're doing and a lack of being able to identify with the project because this is not what I thought it was. So be very clear about your ask if you are asking for anything, but make sure, are you asking for support? Are you asking for involvement? Are you asking for both? What is it you want from people? And then the last thing I wanna mention here is about capturing, oh, sorry, I'm wrong. There's one more. Capturing buy-in and change talk. So like I said before, be listening as you hear feedback, as you hear questions that are being asked, as you're sharing this information, what kinds of things are people saying that suggest that they are actually open to this change? What kinds of things are they saying that suggest that they believe that a change is actually necessary? Capture those things and be prepared to use them in future opportunities to continue to reinforce the need for the change and to continue to craft your, your additional responses. Be able to identify that ambivalence that we talked about where you can say, so here's our situation, but yet I'm hearing you say that there is a need for this to be different and you've listed some specific reasons why. The more you can highlight those and bring those out and talk about them, the more people can start to clear, clear up the fuzziness of the picture that you're trying to paint. Okay. Then the last point is using the naysayer energy. I think that we far too often spend time avoiding or finding ways to quiet the naysayers. But, but what I also believe is that the naysayers have passion and it doesn't matter what their reason for speaking out against the plan or the proposal is. There's a belief there for whatever reason that it shouldn't happen. That tells me that they have a strong belief in the concept overall. So if, if they're opposed to coordinating your system, then that means that they are in favor of something else related to your system. So what is that? And how do we rechannel that energy to a place that's going to create positive change for everyone? And one way to do that is instead of trying to quiet or avoid those naysayers, invite them into the process. Invite them as key players into the process and tell them that you need their voice and you need their passion to better understand what it is they feel like you're missing. It just sounds so counterintuitive, Wally, and I know you're right, um, but I can, I can even feel people in the room is in a room, um, you know, get a bit stressed out about that because it's hard to invite the opposition to the table. Mm -hmm. Why, why, Joni? Why is that hard? Because of the ownership that you have inside, right? Like if, if, if I've done all this work and I think it speaks to all of the things that you've done just before this, if you've done it the way you've done it or laid it out, that's probably going to be fine. But if you've owned this so tightly that you're scared of what anyone is going to say, then it blows it wide open, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that that's difficult because I think that people will take on projects or many people will take on projects without wanting that outside input. And that's uncomfortable or it can be, it shouldn't be, but it can be. For sure, for sure. And I think that there's, fear around that these people who are maybe opposed to what we're suggesting are going to delay our work. I would suggest maybe, but it also might speed up our work in the long run 
because we might be able to hear things from them that we didn't consider before. And if we take that in the right context and perspective, we might be able to get information from them that will actually allow us to make some changes that, uh, that avoid bigger roadblocks down the road. Totally true. And Rhiannon is saying from North Bay is saying, if you can sell it to them, you can sell it to anyone because preaching to the choir is useless. And that's exactly it, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can't convince those naysayers, five years down the road, you're still going to be trying to convince them. Yeah. I remember, I remember being, I don't remember where, I just remember being at this presentation in a community about talking about housing first. And this is when many, many communities were first introducing housing first into their work. And there was, this was in a school gymnasium and there was people in the bleachers and, and all around. And there was this one gentleman, the very top row on one side in the bleachers that was almost heckling me throughout the presentation. And he was very opposed to what was being talked about. Mm -hmm. And eventually all I did was I shared with him that it was obvious to me that this whole concept around homelessness meant a lot to him. And that I would love to hear more from him about what his thoughts were on how we could actually adapt and and utilize this information and do things differently. Can't stop grinning right now. It's hurting my jaw. <laughs> I never heard another word from him that entire presentation until afterwards when he came up to me and he said, where can I get involved? And so, you know, it, acknowledging them is actually going to help to win them over in a lot of situations. I'm not saying everybody, I'm not saying it's gonna work perfectly all the time. But by trying to sort of put them off to the side, you're essentially telling them that we don't like what you're saying. And you're, saying, you're telling them that we don't want to hear anything different than what we're already telling you. And so now they're gonna dig in their heels and they're gonna be that much more of an opposition as opposed to wanting to, to maybe come on your team. And if you look at group dynamics, every group needs to have the devil's advocate in order to be successful. We yeah. need to have those people that are going to challenge what we're saying. Even if they agree with what we're saying, there's some people that just have that knack to be able to throw out the challenge and say, but what about the continual litmus test, right? Exactly. Exactly. So this is, is more conceptual ideas and concepts around creating buy-in in your community, allowing these concepts to be built into your processes of developing your information, developing your vision, and presenting that. Now, I know there's a lot of other details we could talk about regarding specific ways that we could present, specific uh, strategies for presenting information or uh, creating documents or things like that. What we hope to do in the community of practice call is to draw more of those specifics out and especially from different communities that are doing that work and get a little bit more granular about this information. But we do have a few minutes left. I don't know if there's anybody that has any particular questions or just comments or discussion that they'd like to have, but I'm happy to open it up for that for, for the next few minutes. We've, we've got a comment from Linda and Nelson that says, I think there's a nuance to this, knowing which naysayers to engage with and which not to waste your time on. Example, our Landlords Association has been valuable to engage with, but our Chamber of Commerce, no. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And you know, and I would, I would say that I would say that, it, that there's value, definitely. I agree, Linda, that, that there's going to be some that you're going to find out that are only problematic. But I think that there's value in continuing to think about and evaluate what is it 
about that particular group. What is happening there or not happening there that makes this a challenging, um, a challenging sell for them? What makes it difficult for them to kind of join the team, for example? And, and continually engaging them with questions about that, being open again to just asking that hard question about, tell us why you think we're wrong. Tell us, tell us what you would do differently. And just continue to nibble away at what's happening there. It may never change. It may never turn around. But I think if we get to a place where we realize that, okay, these people are actually very problematic in the process, and then we leave it that way, I think we still potentially lose out because down the road, or even, even now, you probably realize if they could be on board, they would be very helpful. So why, why just completely stop attempting? Doesn't mean you have to totally pull them in, but you can continue to chip away by asking questions and being willing to engage in those conversations and hear what they have to say. Um, then Brianna in, in North Bay again, um, so many good comments. One, one step further, positive manipulation. The art of getting someone to do what you want them to do and have them believe it's their own idea. You just have to be able to have them take the credit as well. Mm. So. Yeah, yeah, great point. And that's for that ownership too. Like if you've tightly wound it around your own identity, then you're not going to pass that off. But if you can get champions out there and let them run with it and let them celebrate in it and be part of it, absolutely. There's there's where the momentum really gets going. Yeah. I, I wanted to highlight, Linda Linda also put another comment in the Q&A. Um, she said, really looking forward to the presentation. I think the hardest thing for us in creating buy-in is that so much of the model is already set and there are required elements. This makes it more of a top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach where the ideas and solutions are coming from our own community. Perhaps we need more information on why this taught the specific model was chosen to be implemented across the country, specifically evidence that it works to reduce homelessness. And I think those are, those are great points, um, Linda. Um, I think the, the evidence around reducing homelessness and, and so forth is, is really important. I would say even though the model is already chosen, I would say that that there are definitely ways that you can look at the model as kind of a, a loose framework. And, and so I would suggest that if, if people, uh, other people as well are struggling with feeling like you're being prescripted to a particular model that you don't really have much choice with, that talk to your improvement advisor, talk to whoever your, your TTA uh, training coach is, and, and so forth. And let's talk about that because I think that there's actually a lot of room for adaptation and adjustment. And, and uh, you know, and I think that, I think, but I think you're, you're saying something that is probably common, uh, a common belief or a common feeling for a lot of communities. So I think that's a valuable question. And maybe we will also look to, to provide more of an answer to that in the community of practice. Uh, coming up later. So thank you for that. Well, Wally, you've got two minutes to wrap this up. Okay. Well, um, uh, I would just uh, say I appreciate people coming on, listening. Um, again, we, you saw the poll pop up. And, uh, and so we're, we're happy that uh, people have, have responded. It's anonymous. We don't know who says what. Um, so we really appreciate your feedback in that. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I appreciate, you know, people from all levels of responses there. That's great feedback and information for us. And again, uh, I welcome any further information or details from anybody around their thoughts or input from uh, what's been shared. So thanks again for attending. And uh, we look forward to seeing many of you um, later on. And uh, we hope you have a great day and, and great rest of your week.